Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <clears throat> Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. It's time for Bhagavad Gita. Reading a chapter every night. And tonight is chapter two. We'll read a little Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> Namá Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Rutale Chimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nityanam Namaste Sarasati Dele, Parvani Pachamine, Nivisheisa Sinivati, Pascacha Desatarine. Sarasata Shri Shri Manas Divine Grace A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Arti Kavaka Rubyas Jai Prepasinda Vyavitra Vatita Nam Pavini Vyo Vrishnava Vyo Namaha So I, I'm attached to this edition and uh, I know there are other editions and whatever works for anybody the idea is to be Krishna conscious this is working for me, so this is what I do, and um, I have it here online. <clears throat> so this is chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> so Arjuna has asked to be taken to a vantage point where he can see who is on the battlefield and who he has to fight with and kill. And at that point, he's really devastated because it's his family, his teachers, his superiors, his aunts, his uncles, his brothers, his cousin brothers, it's, it's too much. So that's where we're at with text one of the contents of the Gita summarized. And this is all being related to Dhritarashtra by Sanjaya, who's been given this mystic ability to be sitting there in the palace with Dhritarashtra, but to be able to remote view, as you would say, the battlefield of Kurukshetra. <clears throat> so, text one. Sanjaya said, talking to King Dhritarashtra, 
Seeing Arjuna full of compassion and very sorrowful, his eyes brimming with tears, Madhusudana Krishna spoke the following words. The Supreme Person Bhagavan said, My dear Arjuna, how have these impurities come upon you? They are all be, not at all befitting a man who knows the progressive values of life, who do not lead to higher planets but to infamy. O son of Krita, do not yield to this degrading impotence. It does not become you. Give up such petty weakness of heart and arise, O chastiser of the enemy. Arjuna said, O killer of Madhu Krishna, how can I counterattack with arrows in battle men like Bhishma and Drona, who are worthy of my worship? It is better to live in this world by begging than to live at the cost of the lives of great souls who are my teachers. Even though they are avaricious, they are nonetheless superiors. If they are killed, our spoils will be tainted with blood. Nor do we know which is better, conquering them or being conquered by them. The sons of Dhritarashtra, whom if we killed, we should not care to live, are now standing before us on this battlefield. Now I'm confused about my duty and have lost all composure because of weakness. In this condition, I'm asking you to tell me clearly what is best for me. Now... I am your disciple, a soul surrendered unto you. Please, instruct me. I can find no means to drive away this grief, which is drying up my senses. I will not be able to destroy it, even if I win an unrivaled kingdom on the earth, with sovereignty like that of the demigods in heaven. Sanjaya said, having spoken thus, Arjuna, Chastiser of enemies told Krishna, Govinda, I shall not fight, and fell silent. O descendant of Bharata, at that time Krishna, smiling in the midst of both the armies, spoke the following words to the grief stricken Arjuna. Blessed Lord said, While speaking learned words, you're mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. As the embodied soul continually passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. Self-realized souls not bewildered by such a change. O son of Kunti, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and the disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception. O Skyen of Bharat, one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. O best among men, Arjuna, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress, is steady in both, is certainly eligible for liberation. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent there is no endurance, and of the existent there is no cessation. The seers have concluded by studying the nature of both. Know that which pervades the entire body is indestructible. No one is able to destroy the imperishable soul. Only the material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is subject to destruction. Therefore, fight, O descendant of Bharata. He who thinks that the living entity is the slayer or that he is slain, does not understand. One who is in knowledge knows that the self slays, nor is slain. For the soul is never birth nor death, nor, having once been, does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever-existing, 
undying and primeval, is not slain when the body is slain. O Parta, how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, unborn, eternal, and immutable, kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? As a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, similarly, the soul accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. The soul can never be cut into pieces by any weapon, nor can he be burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burnt nor dry. He's everlasting, all-pervading, unchangeable, immutable, and eternally the same. It is said that the soul is invisible, inconceivable, immutable, and unchangeable. Knowing this, you should not grieve for the body. If, however, you think that the soul is perpetually born and always dies, Still you have no reason to lament, O mighty armed. For one who has taken his birth, death is certain. For one who is dead, birth is certain. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. All creating beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in their interim state, and unmanifest again when they are annihilated. So what need is there for lamentation? Some look on the soul as amazing. Some describe him as amazing. And some hear of him as amazing. While others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. O descendant of Bharata, he who dwells in the body is eternal, can never be slain. Therefore, you need not grieve for any creature. Considering your specific duty as a Kshatriya, you should know that there is no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles, and so there's no need for hesitation. Oparta, happy are the Kshatriyas to whom such fighting opportunities come unsought, opening for them the doors of the heavenly planets. If, however, you do not fight this religious war, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. People will always speak of your infamy, and for one who has been honored, this honor is worse than death. The great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think you have left the battlefield out of fear only, and thus they will consider you a coward. Your enemies will describe you in many unkind words and scorn your ability. What could be more painful for you? O son of Kunti, either you'll be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets, or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. Therefore, get up and fight with determination. Do thou fight for the sake of fighting without considering Happiness or distress, loss or gain, victory or defeat, and by so doing you'll never incur sin. Thus far I have declared to you the analytical knowledge of Sankhya philosophy. Now listen to the knowledge of yoga, whereby one works without fruit of result. O son of Prita, when you act by such intelligence, you can free yourself from the bondage of works. In this endeavor, there's no loss or diminution, and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. Those who are on this path are resolute in purpose, and their aim is one. O beloved child of the Kuros, the intelligence of those who are irresolute is many-branched. Men of small knowledge are very much attached to the flowery words of the Vedas, which recommend various fruit of activities for elevation to heavenly planets, result in good birth, power, and so forth. Being desirous of sense gratification and opulent life, 
They say that there is nothing more than this. In the minds of those who are too attached to sense enjoyment and material opulence, and who are bewildered by such things, the resolute determination of devotional service to the Supreme Lord does not take place. The Vedas mainly deal with the subject of the three modes of material nature. Rise above these modes, O Arjuna. Be transcendental to all of them. Be free from all dualities, from all anxieties for gain and safety, and be established in the self. All the purposes that are served by the small pond can at once be served by the great reservoirs of water. Similarly, all the purposes of the Vedas can be served to one who knows the purpose behind them. You have a right to perform your prescribed duty, but you're not entitled to the fruits of action. Never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of your activities and never be attached to not doing your duty. Be steadfast in yoga, O Arjuna. Perform your duty and abandon all attachment to success or failure. Such evenness of mind is called yoga. O Dhananjaya, rid yourself of all fruit of activities by devotional service and surrender fully to that consciousness. Those who want to enjoy the fruits of their work are misers. A man engaged in devotional service rids himself of both good and bad actions, even in this life. Therefore, strive for yoga, or Arjuna, which is the art of work. The wise engage in devotional service, take refuge in the Lord, and free themselves from the cycles, from the cycle of birth and death, by renouncing the fruits of action in the material world. In this way, they can attain that state beyond all miseries. When your intelligence has passed out of the dense forest of delusion, you shall become indifferent to all that has been heard and that and all that is to be heard. When your mind is no longer disturbed by the flowery language of the Vedas and when it remains fixed in the trance of self-realization, then you will have attained the divine consciousness. Arjuna said, What are the symptoms of one whose consciousness is thus merged in transcendence? How does he speak? What is his language? How does he sit? How does he walk? The Blessed Lord said, O Partha, when a man gives up all varieties of sense desire, which arise from mental concoction, and when his mind finds satisfaction in the self alone, then he is said to be in pure transcendental consciousness, one who is not disturbed in spite of the threefold miseries, who is not elated when there is happiness, and who is free from attachment, fear, and anger, is called a sage of steady mind. He who is without attachment, who does not rejoice when he obtains good, nor lament when he obtains evil, is firmly fixed in perfect knowledge. One who is able to withdraw his senses from sense objects, <clears throat> as the tortoise draws his limbs within the shell, is to be understood as truly situated in knowledge. The embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, though the taste for sense objects remains. But ceasing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste he is fixed in knowledge. The senses are so strong and impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind, even of a man of discrimination who is endeavoring to, con to control them. One who restrains his senses, fixes his senses upon me, is known as a man of steady intelligence. While contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. And from such attachment, lust develops. From lust, anger arises. From anger, delusion arises. 
and from delusion, bewilderment of memory, when memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. When intelligence is lost, one falls down again into the material pool. One who can control his senses by practicing the regulated principles of freedom can obtain the complete mercy of the Lord and thus become free from all attachment and aversion. For one who is so situated in the divine consciousness, the threefold miseries of material existence, the threefold miseries of material existence exist no longer. In such a happy state, one's intelligence soon becomes steady. One who is not in transcendental consciousness can have neither a controlled mind nor steady intelligence without which there is no possibility of peace. And how can there be any happiness without peace? As a boat on the water is swept away by a strong wind, even one of the senses on which the mind focuses can carry away a man's intelligence. Therefore, a mighty armed, one whose senses are restrained from their objects is certainly of steady intelligence. What is night for all beings is the time of awakening for the self-controlled, and the time of awakenings for all beings is night for the introspective sage. A person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter like rivers into the ocean which is ever being filled but is always still can alone achieve peace and not the man who strives to satisfy such desires. A person who has given up all desires for sense gratification, who lives free from desires, who has given up all sense of proprietorship and is devoid of false ego, he alone can attain real peace. That is the way of the spiritual and godly life, after attaining which a man is not bewildered. Being so situated, even at the hour of death, one can enter into the kingdom of God. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Yes, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes many different processes. So, I was noticing how, I, I don't know what verse I forget, but somewhere in the middle of this chapter, Krishna says, he's been describing Sankhya philosophy. And then he gives, he says, I'm going to tell you something else. Another kind of philosophy. Yes, text 39. Krishna says, Thus far I have declared to you the analytical knowledge of Sankhya philosophy. Huh. Why Arjuna should perform his duty. And so many reasons, but devotional service is not mentioned. Up to text 39, there's no mention of devotional service. There's different reasons. Um, you should do your duty um, because no one is ever really killed. We're not these bodies anyway. Um, so you should fight. Um, and even if there is no soul and, and people die, then what's the difference if you kill and they die now or they die later? So he's the presenting all these different um, kind of urging Arjuna to, to fight using the Sankhya philosophical approach about the soul and that can't be burnt, it's never killed, um, it's eternal, just changing bodies. So this is all kind of from the Sankhya philosophy. But here in text 39, Krishna says, 
So far I've declared to you the analytical knowledge of Sankhya, philosophy. Now listen to the knowledge of yoga, whereby one works without fruit of result. So how do you work without fruit of result? You work in devotional service. So now he's going to be talking about devotional service. And it describes... Yeah. that this path, this devotional service path, this bhakti yoga path, he describes, he's, he's describing so many things. I mean, Krishna. To be established from the self, to be transcendental, you're not entitled to the fruits of your, you can work, but you're not entitled to work. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Find satisfaction in the self alone, the transcendental consciousness, divine consciousness. When you work in yoga, steady mind, not disturbed by happiness or distress. A boat on the water swept away by a strong wind, even one of the senses. So as to control the senses, it's all part of the, the yoga. Attain peace. And enter the kingdom of God. So yes, Krishna is describing so many. In the next chapter, chapter 3, is about karma yoga. So there was Sankhya yoga. Now, this uh, leading into karma yoga, we work, how to work for Krishna, and then transcendental knowledge. So chapter three is just karma yoga. You're not really introducing Krishna so much. That comes in chapter five. And then a deeper discussion of Sankhya yoga in chapter six. And then knowledge, attain the supreme, confidential knowledge, universal form, devotional service, and the conclusion, the perfection of renunciation. So we'll read chapter three tomorrow. Karma Yoga. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Uh, not a not, not a very long chapter, it's a short chapter. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna Chaitanya.